So this is a intro video, scholars, for chemical reactions. And um, when we think about chemical reactions, there's some things that come to mind. One of the things is that chemical reactions always have a chemical change. And for chemical reactions to have a chemical change, what this really means is that we are forming and or breaking chemical bonds. Because we're forming and or breaking chemical bonds, this usually means that energy is released or absorbed by the chemical reaction from the surroundings. And if energy is released, you might remember in biology, we drew little diagrams like this, where because the energy of the system went down, this energy came out of the system to the surroundings. And if energy was released and the energy went to the surroundings, especially if that energy is in the form of heat, then we can think of that reaction as being exothermic. And if energy was absorbed because the energy of the system went up, that energy had to come from the surroundings. So the energy flowed from the surroundings into the chemical reaction. And that is an example of an endothermic reaction. So where might you use exothermic or endothermic reactions in your daily lives? Well, endothermic reactions where heat is absor absorbed from the surroundings, where energy is absorbed from the surroundings, this usually makes the surroundings colder. And so one of the cases where this can be used very easily is to make ice packs. Specifically, ice packs for first aid. These are the kinds of packs that sit at room temperature and then you break some sort of pocket of liquid into some other solid and you mix it and the solution, the liquid gets cold. And this is an example of an endothermic process where the surroundings become colder because the reaction taking place in the solid requires energy. Exothermic, sometimes you may have seen these with hand warmers. or sometimes heat wraps. In, spe in specific cases, this is because there is some sort of an iron pellet and that iron pellet reacts with oxygen in some way to make some sort of iron oxide. And that process releases energy to the surroundings, warming things up, making them hotter. So this is an example of an exothermic reaction. Um, when we write chemical reactions, we always write reactants and then an arrow and then the products. And we read that arrow as yields or makes or produces or react to form. And so in the case of iron and oxygen reacting to form iron oxide, whether that's iron two or iron three doesn't really matter in this case, that's how we read that reaction. When we look at these chemical reactions, no matter what kinds of reactions they are, we typically see things coming out of the chemical reaction. One of those things could be evolution of energy. In this case, evolution means to produce. 
And that energy could be in form of heat or light. Sometimes even sound. And again, this kind of connects back to the idea of the exo and endothermic. One of the other things that you can see sometimes, not always, is a color change. So if you have some compounds, especially in a solution, and the color somehow changes, that's another indicator of a chemical reaction. You can also have the production of gas. How would you know a gas was being formed? If, if it's in a solution, you would see bubbles. You can also form what's called a precipitate. When you think about that word precipitate, maybe you think about rain or snow, i.e. precipitation and rain and snow and all that water that falls from the sky is called precipitation because it's falling out of the atmosphere. In this case, a precipitate is a solid that falls out of a solution. The third thing that can be produced is not as easy to see with the naked eye, but it is another a sign that a chemical reaction has occurred, which would be the production of water. Now, if you produce a gas, sometimes when you write the chemical reaction, you might draw an arrow up following that gas to show that it leaves the system and that it leaves the system completely. A precipitate might have an arrow down again to show that it falls out of the solution. So precipitates that form in test tubes or beakers, at least depending on the size of the solid particles, typically settle out onto the bottom of the test tube or the beaker. One of the other symbols that you can use is you can use um, a reversible arrow. So let's say that you've got acetic acid and ammonia and you carry out this reaction to make ammonium acetate. This is a reversible chemical reaction so it gets a double arrow because it can react these two here can react to form the ammonium acetate, but the ammonium acetate can also react to form the original reactants. So that's what a reversible reaction means, is that that reaction can react in the forward direction or in the reverse direction. One of the other things that we put on to reactions are state symbols. And I think I've shown these to you before. We have S for a solid. We have L for a liquid. We have G for a gas. And we have AQ for things that are aqueous. In other words, dissolved in water. So if we look at our acetic acid and ammonia reaction, in this reaction, all of these would be aqueous because this reaction would take place in solution. If I come back up to our iron and oxygen making some sort of ferric oxide, the iron is a solid because it's a metal the oxygen is a gas because we know it's in the atmosphere and the ferric oxide or ferrous oxide, some sort of a rust would have to be a solid at room temperature. Again, because it's an ionic compound and we're going to think about all ionic compounds as being solids at room temperature. 
even though there are exceptions to that. As another example of some of the state symbols you might get in here, you might have a reaction. Let's say that you have um, sodium bicarbonate, which is a solid that you add this to pure, in other words, no water around, so it's gonna be a liquid, you add this to pure acetic acid. That acid and that compound can react. And in the long run, they will make sodium acetate which would be aqueous and water, which would be liquid and carbon dioxide gas. And so you might also put an up arrow right after that carbon dioxide gas to show that it leaves the system, that it bubbles away after that chemical reaction. The production of gas, precipitate, or water, these specifically are called driving forces for what are called double replacement reactions. But they can also occur for many other reactions. One of the other symbols that you can have on these reaction arrows is you might apply heat to something. So you could say calcium carbonate reacts in the presence of heat. If you're adding heat, we use that triangle, that delta to symbolize change in temp. Specifically, that temperature is going to be higher. But you could also choose to state the temperature. So you could specify, let's say, 250 degrees Celsius. You could also, over the reaction arrow, list another compound. And if you list another compound, that other compound is a catalyst which speeds up a reaction by providing a different mechanism. And then I think this is the final thing, the second to final thing to talk about in this video which is what is a mechanism and the mechanism simply shows the steps in a chemical reaction that changes the reactants and it could just be focused on one reactant or it could be multiple. The mechanism shows the steps in a chemical reaction that change, sorry, the reactants into the products. And so Thinking back to our Lewis structures, if we drew that boron trifluoride, and that was an octet exception, oops, fluorine, it only had six electrons. We knew that it would like to get eight, but it couldn't get eight unless it broke its, um, formal charge rules like 
if it had an extra charge when there didn't need to be one there. But we could take this and we could react it with another molecule like ammonia that has a lone pair. And that lone pair on that nitrogen can be donated to create a bond to that boron. And in this case, that's the mechanism. And the final product here between the boron trifluoride and the ammonia. And I'm going to leave out the lone pairs on all of the fluorines. This would be the final molecule. Notice the nitrogen here would have a formal charge of a positive, and the boron would have a formal charge of a negative. But even though it is weird there in terms of the formal charges, the boron does still now satisfy the octet rule. So just like with the carbon monoxide, when we looked at that and looked at the formal charges, the boron here does want to react to accept lone pairs of electrons. And how do we know this was a chemical reaction? Well, we formed a chemical bond between two of our reactants in this reaction. The final topic here would just be to list the types of chemical reactions. And there are five types of chemical reactions that we want to be able to recognize in this class. And they are synthesis, sometimes called combination, the reverse of synthesis, the reverse of putting things together would be to break them apart, and that is decomposition. There is also combustion and single and double replacement reactions. There are many other types of chemical reactions. You could think about calling chemical reactions acid base. You could talk about oxidation reduction. And these other types of chemical reactions can be seen in many of these five general types that we're going to look at in one of the next videos.